Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the Fulbright Junior Faculty Development Program. Um, this webinar will provide everyone with information on the Fulbright Junior Faculty Development Program from Egypt and Jordan. Um, the session is specifically geared to focus on the request for proposal, the RFP process. My name is Diane Price, and I am the program manager for this program. And I'm joined by my colleague, Shannon Conheady. Um, she's a program assistant for the senior program assistant for this program. And we are the co-presenters today. So um, I know you're probably wondering how long this session will last. I know you're all busy. Um, we are anticipating that it'll last about an hour. Um, and we're gonna try to keep it concise and just give you information that pertains to the proposal and the action, the actual um, program. Um, my colleague Shannon will kick off our session today and share information about the general Fulbright program. Um, and then we'll delve more deeply into into the junior faculty development program and then allow time for questions and answers at the end. Um, we anticipate that this will conclude around 1.30. Um, we also want to note that this presentation will be recorded, so if you're unable to stay for the entire duration of the program um, of this presentation, you can also visit our website where it will be posted so that you can listen to it um, at your convenience. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Shannon. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we dive into the proposal components, we thought we would give a, we would provide a brief introduction to the Fulbright program in general. Um, the Fulbright program created by Senator J. William Fulbright of Arkansas in 1945 and signed into law by President Harry S. Truman in 1946 is the flagship international educational exchange program sponsored by the US government. It's active in more than 160 countries, and the program is designed to increase mutual understanding between the peoples of the U.S. and the world. To date, more than 380,000 Fulbrighters have participated in the program, with 8,000 grants being awarded annually. As a cooperating agency working directly with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which we will refer to as ECA throughout this presentation, um, and in cl close cooperation with binational Fulbright commissions and U.S. embassies, Amit East has administered the Fulbright Foreign Student Program for the Middle East and North Africa since 1969. And this will be our second year administering the Fulbright Junior Faculty Development Programs. So this slide has a bit of an overview of the program goals. The intent of this 10-week summer program for junior faculty from Egypt and Jordan is to equip junior faculty with the tools needed to build higher education capacity within their home institutions and advance education for future generations. The JFDP program for Egypt and Jordan also share a common core goal with the Fulbright Foreign Student Program of increasing mutual understanding between peoples and countries with a specific emphasis on fostering sustainable and long-term relationships between visiting faculty and U.S. academic communities, even after the conclusion of the U.S. portion of the program. A strong proposal will cater to the hybrid nature of this program, including both an organized academic schedule and a cultural element. So this is a bit of a background on what the junior faculty candidates will look like. Um, the potential cohort members will be nominated through an open merit-based uh, competition. And in order to qualify for this program, a potential junior faculty member must be a citizen and a resident of the nominating country. They have to be fluent in spoken and written English. They have demonstrated a commitment to classroom teaching and an interest in strengthening teaching leadership skills. And they hold either an MA or an MS degree with at least five years of university level teaching experience or they have a PhD and no more than five years of university level teaching experience. Um, or lastly, they are an MA or an MS degree holder who is currently enrolled in a PhD program and they must possess at least three years of university level teaching experience. And the faculty members experience will be in the field for which they are nominated, which we will get to in a couple slides. So the programs that we are offering this year, uh, we will be working directly with both commission and embassy staff and ECA. And ECA has determined that the following cohort disciplines are areas of need in their respective countries. The disciplines are subject to change in the future. So if you do not see 
uh, a discipline that is applicable to your university, please come back um, and see what other cohorts will be offered. Um, I'll briefly discuss the cohorts for each country for the summer of 2020. So the Fulbright program for Egypt will run from June 30th through September 8th of 2020. And the discipline that we are recruiting for is information technology. The subjects um, under the second bullet point are all of the sub-disciplines um, that the faculty might have specialties in. Um, and that will be about six participants. Um, those numbers are subject to change, but you should um, anticipate six participants for that cohort from Egypt. And then the two cohorts we are recruiting for for Jordan are One Health, which is a combination of public health, community nursing, infectious diseases, and epidemiology, and environmental sustainability, which includes arid lands, sustainable agriculture, water conservations and hydrology, alternative and renewable energy. And both of those cohorts will have six participants as well. And um, that program is going to run June 21st through August 30th of 2020. So the dates are a bit different for the Egypt and the Jordanian cohorts. So before we uh, hand everything over to Diane, I wanted to go over host institution eligibility. Um, and we wanna make sure you're eligible to apply before you put in the work to submit a proposal. Um, so to meet the requirement standards, you need to be eligible, your university needs to be eligible to receive federal funding and not be disbarred. They must, you must be registered institution of higher education. You must be an accredited institution as deemed by a US Department of Education recognized accrediting agency. You must also have a capacity to host the visiting scholars and implement academic program for specific, specified cohort disciplines. And lastly, you must demonstrate previous experience designing and managing professional development programs. We asked for that because such experience really provides the institution with well-honed best practices that they can draw from when implementing these types of programs. So I'm going to turn it over to Diane, who's going to delve a little bit more deeply into the program elements. Thank you, Shannon. Um, now we're gonna discuss the program elements. Um, you'll see five here. Um, we really want you to take a comprehensive approach in designing um, these elements to ensure that the visiting faculty are exposed to academic-based professional development, as well as cultural aspects associated with life in the United States. Um, each proposal submission must feature the following elements. Um, and as I, as I noted previously, later slides will also go into further detail about the respective program elements. So first is our arrival orientation. The orientation really does set the tone um, of the program and should be utilized as a time to acquaint the visiting um, faculty with the, your institution. Then there is an on-campus academic pr um, program. This portion of the program consists of a structured 10-week academic program that exposes junior faculty to teaching and research methodologies among other areas. Next, we have the mentorship component. Um, the mentorship component should be structured to reinforce reinforce program objectives and provide individualized support and opportunities to build um, relations between U.S. academics and also the visiting faculty members. Um, lastly, we have the community engagement and cultural enrichment activities. And it's pretty important that the junior faculty to be, um, be exposed to the community surrounding the U.S. host campus. Um, we want them to uh, get familiar with your U.S. campus, and we also um, want them to get familiar with the greater world surrounding your campus and be engaged with the local community. Activities that promote junior faculty engagement with Americans ex and exposes them to U.S. culture is highly valued. And then the last component is the re-entry workshop. While this is not um, directly addressed in your proposal, it is an important component that will be administered by Ahmed East. Um, the re-entry workshop actually takes place in Washington, D.C. and is funded by the Department of State, and it prepares junior faculty for their transition back to their home country and also provides participants with professional development and opportunity to learn about alumni engagement opportunities. So let me reiterate, um, while that's an important feature, the re-entry workshop is actually one component, one element that you won't have to worry about addressing in your proposal. And now we're gonna to go to the 
cover the U.S. host institution program deliverables um, that will be addressed in your proposal narrative and include the previously mentioned program components. The narrative is not to exceed five pages, but it is essential that you articulate why your institution should be selected to host and what impact it will have on your institution and your community, and also how it will advance institutional objectives if you are selected. It's important that you um, also be specific in your descriptions and discuss who is expected to conduct um, proposed sessions and also the format and de of delivery. In describing why your institution is best suited to host, you also need to describe institutional knowledge and expertise in the subject area. Perhaps you can even go into uh, past collaborations or maybe your past experience in the region. Um, the narrative should really be concise but also descriptive. Keep in mind that you can also include additional details in the appendices, so don't feel confined to the, the five-page narrative restriction. Um, you can also add details um, in a chart form or um, in another area or another format that you feel um, would convey information. So we have our academic program content. Um, when discussing this component, remember to articulate how you plan to address um, the academic program requirements. As, um, as you can see, I've broken it down a bit. So for the pre-arrival communication, um, pre-arrival communication is important to build relations between U.S. faculty and the visiting grantees before they actually arrive. And this helps aid in the transition um, of the faculty members before they come to the U.S. and also helps solidify um, mentor-faculty uh, relationships. The orientation, as previously stated, is important because it helps junior faculty adjust to their new environment, and it also takes place during the first week of arrival and provides the opportunity to discuss program regulations, faculty introductions, academic overview, and also sets the tone for letting the junior faculty understand program expectations. This is really an ideal time to also schedule uh, campus tours, introduce the faculty members to banking systems and also um, help them establish cell phone services if they need so. Um, with that said, we will also have an Amity staff member um, present for at least a day or two at the beginning of the orientation session um, so that they can provide additional information about the program regulations and also ensure that um, documents such as tax forms and the media release forms are completed in a timely manner. Next, we go into on-campus program. This is the main component. Um, you will need to go into detail about the instructional content and discuss how you will incorporate required topics such as teaching and research methodology, instructional and technology, U.S. higher education system overview into your program. Um, I'll provide a sample calendar that will be reviewed shortly, which will also give you some insight in how you can structure programming for a week, as an example. Um, the academic components should be delivered in a variety of formats that include workshops, seminars, observations, lectures, and other creative instructional means. In order to supplement academic components, it's also advisable to include professional meetings, site visits, and networking events to allow junior faculty an opportunity to see the practical applications of their disciplines. And these activities will really help faculty gain a better understanding of their relationships um, especially between the universities and the surrounding communities. And then finally, we have the mentor structure. Um, this is an area that oftentimes gets overlooked, but it is considered one of the most crucial aspects of the program. You really need to give a good amount of attention to this um, area and how you plan to structure it. Um, in the proposal, you need to describe your plan for ensuring a proper match between U.S. academics and junior faculty and indicate a plan to establish rapport. Mentors should be paired one-on-one, -on -one, but we do understand that it is sometimes not possible. Um, so we do permit the pairing of two, two junior faculty members with one U.S. faculty member. Um, what we do not support are a group mentoring um, where the entire cohort is assigned to one mentor or meet as a group. Um, we really do um, focus on the individualized mentorship component. And finally, we expect the meetings between 
mentors to take place at a minimum of one time per week um, for the entire duration of the program. Um, next, we have cultural engagement. Um, in this proposal, you'll need to also describe how faculty will be exposed to life in the U.S. through host family engagement, cultural site visits, campus activities, and such. It's important to recognize that this is not a one-way transaction, and there should also be opportunities for the junior faculty to share about their home culture um, and history. And then also, you'll notice in our RFP, they mention, it mentions host families. Um, and this is for the scholars to meet periodically to help facilitate the cultural immersion aspect of the program. Um, they are not expected to be housed um, at host, with host families um, in the traditional sense. So you don't have to worry about um, the expectation of the mentors being housed with specific host families. And then we have post-program communication relationship um, building. You should, you should propose some ways that you plan on maintaining relationships at the conclusion of the program, whether that be through potential joint publications or conference presentations. Um, make sure that you address post-program communication as well. Okay, we have faculty mem mentorship. As you can see, faculty men mentorship has been sectioned off because we really want to stress the importance of this component. It is a key means for building relationships within this program. Uh, matches should be based off of research interests. Um, you will need to plan for pre-arrival communication, as I stated previously, and that can either be done via Skype or even email, and um, we've seen that be successful. Um, the pre-meeting allows for mentors to communicate with the mentee, to talk about their expectations, um, address questions about the mentorship structure, structure, and also to talk about the academic content that's going to take place. Um, in the narrative, you can focus on the structure of the mentorship and how you also um, can address you can also address detailed information in the appendices section um, where you can list proposed faculty members and their respective research interests. Um, and with that said, you can include that information in the appendices, but please keep in mind to keep the CVs to eight pages maximum. Um, we do get a lot of um, CVs with uh, over 100 pages worth of publications. So keep it to eight pages, and I think that will be able to convey, convey the expertise of um, the proposed mentor. Um, and then also, while you may not have each person identified at the time of submission, you should also, you should be able to indicate a few potential participants. Um, you may not have the detailed background of the junior scholars at the junior faculty at the time of the proposal development, but you'll at least know the discipline and subcategories of the field. Um, so that should at least be able to give you a gist of what should be expected of the background of the scholars who are, who are in the specific field that you are proposing for, submitting a proposal for. And now here's a sample agenda, a sample calendar that I've developed um, for you. Um, as an example, um, this showcases how you could potentially arrange one week. You'll see a range of activities and educational formats of particular uh, participant dialogues, specialty topics, site visits, assigned readings, observations, synthesis sessions, and such. Um, topics discussed are diverse, as you can see. Um, we suggest that you be creative and design ways to discuss topics through the lens of the academic discipline. Some of the required topics to be included are U.S. higher education structure, leadership in higher education, curriculum development, teaching methodology, fundraising, higher education, education in global area. All of these topics are listed in the RFP. Um, please refer to that for additional details. Um, it's also a great opportunity to expose the junior faculty to diverse teaching styles um, by leading a class, a class session or to get some practical experience with their newly acquired skills. Um, this is an opportunity to expose the scholars to practical knowledge and on how to incorporate these topics in their home institutions. 
So as you can see on the agenda, you'll see Friday marked as a community college visit day. Um, it's an example of a good way to incorporate another institution into your program to show a different type of education format. And then if you can look at Thursday afternoon from 1 to 6 p.m., that's structured in a way where the group learns about leadership and higher education. And then later on in that day, they have an opportunity for a Q&A session with the dean. They then follow up with a meeting at the Chamber of Commerce to participate in the lecture series with technological ties to economic development. So you can see there, there are strategic tie-ins between the different offerings throughout the day. So really think about how you want to arrange their days. And then lastly, we advocate providing a day off for participants to have some time to themselves. It gives them an opportunity to collect their thoughts. Um, this program is quite intensive and while not mandatory, um, based off of feedback from previous programs, we believe including a day off will provide scholars with an opportunity um, to recharge. And then next we're going to cultural activities. Um, this is where you can really be truly creative and include a variety of options. You want to include museums, of course, artistic performances and recreational activities, um, community engagement with family pairings, that's, that could be with um, host families or as much appreciated as well. You can even have cookouts, attend state fairs, volunteer activities, it runs the gamut. Um, there's cultural lectures and also events and um, the junior faculty can give presentations about their countries to either local schools or community organizations. We really leave that open to you all um, so that you can really showcase your creativity with what your university location has to offer. And the next we're going to turn um, to resources and logistical support. Um, the next group of topics can be highlighted in the appendices section um, as it allows additional space to articulate plans that couldn't um, be, um, that couldn't fit in the narrative section of your proposal. So we're going to start off with the personnel. Um, you'll need to include, um, you'll need to indicate personnel responsible for program implementation. So you'll have to designate a, the lead members so the administrative lead is responsible for oversight as it pertains to grant administration and budgets. Then we have the faculty lead. They guide the implementation process. They serve as the primary liaison amongst um, the East junior faculty and the host institution. That's a person I will most likely connect with for the duration of the program. This person is extremely important for grant management and therefore, therefore should be clearly indicated in your proposal. And then finally, there's the cultural lead who will con coordinate community and cultural engagement opportunities. Next, we have housing. Um, your proposal must indicate an ability to provide suitable housing for the junior faculty. Hosts must provide furnished studio or apartment style housing that is located on campus or campus adjacent. While the preferred method of housing the grantees is to give them a private bedroom, private bathroom, and private kitchen, you will not be disqualified for proposing housing that has a shared kitchen as long as each grantee has their own bathroom and own bedroom. Um, this is actually a significant change from the previous year, and hopefully this flexibility will ease the house um, the search for housing over the summer. So with that change, we, while we prefer individual housings with their own kitchen, bedroom, bathroom. We are definitely willing to consider um, shared housing where the scholar has their own bedroom and bathroom where they should share a living space and a kitchen. Um, next, we have access to university facilities. It's expected that the junior faculty will have access to institutional facilities such as a lab in the library, as well as access to database, online catalogs, and departmental libraries. And then finally, transportation. Um, you should include an overview of system of transportation because we really want to make sure our grantees have some sense of independence and we want to make sure that they can get around somewhat within the, commun the campus community. And now we're going to pivot to funding. 
Um, funding is provided for up to $15,600 per junior faculty participant and is inclusive of administrative costs, participant support costs, and housing. Um, while there is no strict maximums for budget line items, we expect that administrative costs to not exceed 40%. Um, in addition, um, junior faculty will be covered by um, ASPE, which is Ask Accident and Sickness Program for Exchanges health benefit plan. Uh, Ahmed East will manage all international domestic air travel, and thus such costs should not be included in your proposal. And lastly, as I previously noted, junior faculty um, will part participate in a two-day reentry workshop um, where they will fly to, UN fly to Washington, D.C. Um, and participate in that workshop. And this will be organized by Amity East and the Department of State, so you don't need to take any action with that. And also, the, the junior faculty members will receive a per diem, so you do not have to include that as well in your proposal. And lastly, before I hand it back over to Shannon, um, there are budgeting and reporting requirements associated with this program, of course. Um, all proposals must include a budget and corresponding budget narrative that provides justification for the anticipated program costs. You will find the budget template provided to you on our JFDP website. And also keep in mind that any costs exceeding the 15,600 grantee maximum will be considered as cost share. And lastly, host institutions are expected to conform to the OMB circulars. Institutions are considered sub-recipients and will sign a service agreement that outlines reporting requirements. And so now I'm handing it over back to Shannon. So submitted proposals will go through a competitive review process and will be assessed based on the series of items you see noted on this slide. For detailed evaluation information, you can reference section four in the RFP that provides information on the required components upon which you will be assessed. So first we have host commitment and expert expertise. Make sure that your proposal showcases your commitment to promoting an environment of exchange, provide support, and also have subject area expertise. Also be sure to highlight your past record of successfully implementing programs. Expertise and commitment are key attributes that reviewers will be looking for when assessing your proposal. They really wanna know that you actually have a commitment and also have the expertise to execute what you are proposing. Next, we have curriculum and professional resources. This section allows you to demonstrate the array of resources that you have access to at your university. Reviewers will assess originality of how you construct your activities and how it aligns with the overall program objectives. Ensure you emphasize teaching and research methodologies, technology, and U.S. higher education. You are encouraged to discuss instructional methods that you plan to incorporate, such as workshops, seminars, skills building exercises, and if you have any potential participants from professional organizations that really can add to the practical aspects of the discipline, disciplines as well. Um, next, we have lead contact arrangements. Uh, as Diane mentioned, please clearly define the roles of the lead contacts and ensure that they have a strong background in the area of responsibility that they will have. The reviewers will look for indication of a successor plan as well as well should one of the contacts be unable to fill duties during the program period. Keep in mind this program is the summer, so we know people are on vacation, so just keep that in mind when you're choosing your lead contacts. Um, please also keep in mind that the dates are different for the Egypt and the Jordan, Jordanian cohorts. Um, the mentorship structure, as we've mentioned, is an extremely important part of this program. Uh, be sure to articulate your plan for ensuring proper matching between the mentors and the visiting faculty members. Make sure the research interests and the academic backgrounds prove to be conducive to strong mentoring relationships, and make sure that all of those align. Reviewers will look to see how well thought out your plan is to in initialize a mentorship and structure or introductions. Then we have integrated program components. Reviewers will be looking for a clear emphasis on faculty development, and it's essential that your program address the intersection of faculty development, mentoring, and cultural engagement. Remember, all three of those are key program components. Next, we have logistics, which includes housing, transportation, and orientation. 
Remember, as Diane said, that private housing is preferred, but shared kitchen and living spaces will be considered if private housing is unavailable. But also remember, they still need to have their own bedroom and bathroom. Uh, for logistics, please be sure to include information about research facilities that are relevant to the cohort background, also libraries, and also include transportation information about local transportation if uh, housing is off campus. Um, community resources and participants as resources. This is an important aspect of this program and reviewers will be looking for details that demonstrate that the junior faculty will have opportunities to engage with US citizens. This can include host family activities, cultural engagement, volunteering activities. They will also be looking for in inclusion of opportunities and then also remember, make sure to provide junior faculty opportunities to share about their home country and culture. Then you have your cost proposal. Reviewers will be assessing whether the proposed costs are necessary and appropriate. Please keep that in mind. Um, be sure to use the provided budget template to reflect all program costs and also include the budget narratives that provides justification for those costs. Uh, follow on activities. Reviewers will look for evidence that you have a plan for follow up with program alumni. Part of this program is to strengthen uh, institutional partnerships. So this is a, an important part of the proposal and oftentimes was left out in previous proposals. Um, so please be sure to include that. And then last, we have monitoring and evaluation. Proposals should have a plan to assess impact and demonstrate ability to link out outcomes to pro program objectives. And then Diane's gonna go a little bit more into the submission of the proposal. Okay. So now we have the proposal cover sheet. Um, for the actual submission of your proposal, there will be key components that you will find on this document um, on the JFDP website. The proposal cover sheet will allow you to enter contact information and identify the cohort discipline that you desire to host. This document will be attached to your proposal and you'll see that um, the document is listed right above the RFP on our website. You will need to fill that document out and include it in include it with your submission. You'll use the form um, that is created for your specific country, so you'll see it listed under either Egypt or Jordan, and they'll have the country reflected at the top of the proposal sheet. Um, you will also have to include your DUNS number and all the lead contact information. And we will now just briefly run back over the proposal requirements. Um, the slide contains the proposal items that must be included to ensure you have a complete proposal submission. So we have institutional proposal cover page um, that includes the name of your institution and academic department, name and contact information of staff, DINS number and tax ID number. Then we have the proposal narrative that we spend a big chunk of time discussing. Um, that includes the institutional background and um, capacity, academic program content, um, mentoring structure, community engagement opportunities, and how you anticipate how your program will meet outcomes um, for the institution. Appendices where you can go into further detail, um, since the narrative is restricted to five pages, you can add additional details um, in this section. So names and qualifications of designated lead contacts. Um, please um, ensure that you keep CVs to a maximum of eight pages. Um, list the proposed faculty mentors and their respective research interests and um, action plan for community engagement, um, sample program schedule, um, similar to what we had in the sample agenda posted um, or whatever format you deem fitting. Um, information about university uh, facilities. So if you want to show brochures about your housing, you can include it there. Um, any information about local transportation um, and or the housing facilities, feel free to include that in that section. And you can also, um, you can also include letters of support from your university and community as well. So while not required, uh, it's appreciated. And then last but not least, the budget proposal with the corresponding narratives that provide justification for costs. Um, so please feel free to contact us at jfdp at amadis.org if you have questions that were not answered in this presentation. Um, we're gonna have a, a moment for question and answers in a second. Um, 
As we know, you most likely will have questions throughout the coming weeks, so just send us an email. We'll respond to you in a timely manner. Uh, you can also visit our website for additional information. There's FAQs there, the cover sheet, the RFPs are there, um, and this presentation will be housed on our website, so you can refer to that as well. And then submission checklist. The most important thing that you should note is a submission due date, which is October 15th, 2019, and um, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so you, this gives you enough time to put together a proposal. Um, make sure that we have it, that you have it submitted by October 15th. Um, we have a checklist of items that you must make sure to include so that, um, which also includes your cover sheet and make sure your organizational information is included, your qualifications, your record of performance, your statement of work, and your cost proposal. Um, these are all items that must be conveyed at some point um, in your proposal. So that is our presentation at this point. Um, and I would like to open up the floor for any questions that you may have, which you would um, chat into the chat box and we will be able to address that to you. We can answer your questions. We'll give you a moment. Okay, our first question is, um, do participants need to live on campus, close to campus, or are our host families okay for the whole time as long as they have a private bedroom and bathroom? Um, with scholars, unfortunately, we, we do not advocate using host families. Um, we would like for all of our scholars um, either to be on campus or close to campus. Um, they could be in graduate housing, where they have their own bedroom and bathroom and have their and can share a living room. Um, we've also had people housed at hotels. While not ideal, um, it is still suitable. Um, so we have graduate housing, we have studio apartments, um, one bedroom apartments, um, as long as that they as long as they, they are furnished apartments. Um, but we don't have faculty members staying at um, host families, though. Next question, is the reentry during the 10-week program scheduled for June 30th through September 8th or after this window? The reentry workshop will take place within the 10 week window of the program. Since we have two programs that are somewhat off cycle, um, we will schedule the re-entry to take place um, during a time where the programs overlap. So most likely it will be the second or third week of August. Next question is, for academic disciplines, do we need to have faculty expertise in each of the subtopics they listed or just a majority of the sub, um, subtopics listed? Yes, um, we would appreciate that you have, um, at, have expertise in the majority of the subject um, topics listed. We don't anticipate, we don't expect you to have expertise in all of the topics. Um, we tried to conclude the grantee selection process by December, January, so that we can then provide um, universities with at least a general background of the scholars that will be coming um, later on in the summer. And typically, they represent a broad range of disciplines, but usually it's around 50 to 75 percent of all of the disciplines that are listed under all, the, all of these sub-disciplines listed under one discipline. So we don't expect your university to have expertise in all of the um, sub-disciplines.
Okay, we'll give it another minute for questions. Oh, someone wrote also, is it okay for two institutions to apply together for one program? Um, we actually love to see institutions applying together. Um, we like that because it really shows that there's um, recognizing the partnership aspect um, and showcases how universities can work together. So while you you will submit one proposal, you can include information from two universities. Um, let me jump down. Just to confirm that participants will stay all 10 weeks at one institution, at one host institution. Um, yes, in most cases, if one institution um, submits a proposal for the grantees to stay at their institution, they, the grantees will be assigned to them for the full 10 week process. If you do a joint submission, um, you may be able to split that up half and half or maybe one third and then two thirds at the other institution. Um, but if it is one institution submitting a proposal, um, the scholars will be expected to stay there um, for the 10 weeks program. Um, with the exception of the re-entry portion, which will be over a three-day with three -day period in Washington, D.C. Um, what cultural ac activities have you found participants to appreciate the most? Um, there has been a variety. Um, I, over the last 10 weeks, we've noticed that participants really enjoy the volunteering activities, like a variety of volunteering activities. We've had, um, you know, working in local gardens, working in food banks, working with um, prisoners. There's multiple different kinds of activities. They all loved those. Um, we've had people go to the state fairs. Um, we've had people go to national parks, rodeos, um, rodeos yes. just to exhibit, you know, the culture of your area of the United States. It's so different depending on where the schools are, but um, those kinds of activities uh, are really fun for the participants and they seem to really enjoy them. Yeah. Okay, I would believe we answered all the questions that we have received so far. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to re reach out to us um, using the JFDP at amadis.org um, email address and we'll make sure to answer your questions um, as soon as possible. Um, and if you, that questions and we will have this recording posted on our website as well for you to review um, at a more convenient time or again um, oh, last question is there a deadline for questions to be answered on the website was September 6 um, but we are answering questions right now as well so Make sure that you get your questions in um, as soon as possible, and we'll be able to then post responses um, online. Okay, well, I think we are going to wrap things up and feel free to contact us. We really are excited about your interest in the junior faculty development program. We've received wonderful feedback from our current um, cohorts across the US. And so we hope for um, some of you to join in on programming next year. Have a great Wednesday. Bye-bye.